Well, hi everyone. I know many of you, um, but I'm Katherine Heim. Uh, you will know me in the Valley for different reasons. Rover's Ranch uh, dog boarding is certainly great. Worked at David Ebinger's office. And in my former life over on the wet side of the mountains, I was a paralegal, a litigation paralegal. Um, my husband and I came over here in 2000 seven, bought in 2005, built and then moved in full time 2007. Um, and I shared with some of you my story of what sort of led me to get really active in the fire uh, arena, fire preparedness in particular. Um, let's just say I've been involved in some um, uh, evacuations that jumped from nothing to a level three instantaneously and my husband and I had to evacuate ourselves, our dogs, our cat, and all our kennel dogs. So nothing like uh, that kind of experience to make you understand that um, you want to do everything you can to help other people um, become empowered to take the steps they need to do to help prepare themselves. That was, by the way, the Rising Eagle Fire 2014. Um, so I, for the last year and a half, have volunteered with, uh, it started off being Fire Adapted Winthrop Program, and then we've expanded, we're Fire Adapted Methow Valley Program, and we are a program that's uh, working with the long-term recovery group here in the Methow Valley. We do a lot of work with um, helping folks get connected um, with resources such as the Okanagan Conservation District, Fire District 6 and the cost sharing program through Department of Natural Resources. We also uh, really help facilitate education such as this. And we're um, doing volunteer work actually helping with Metow at Home and Kiwanis in trying to expand the program of ways to bring able-bodied volunteers and skilled knowledgeable people to uh, help work with people who don't have the capacity um, and economic means to be doing some of the fuel reduction work. There's some good stuff going on in the valley. There's a twist, um, town of twist has a chipper and they're starting to try to get a program together to help folks in twist um, clear their property. Um, Max and I have known each other for many years. Uh, one of the great joys of having the dog boarding kennel is you get to know a lot of people and I have gotten to know a lot of the people involved in fire preparedness and mitigation and fighting fire, fire response, because we get their dogs. So um, I am really excited to let Max take it away and tell you who she is and do her fabulous slide presentation, which um, I will tell you uh, when Patrick and I nearly missed getting burned in um, while rising in the Okanagan Conservation District and had a huge to-do list. We started in on that and it was daunting. It was truly, truly daunting. Um, having Max as a good friend was very helpful because Max kept reminding me of ways that we could do this in a manageable way and working from the house out. And I'm going to let her tell you everything she knows based on her many, many years experience. I'll be doing the slideshow. I am going to need to bolt immediately afterwards. Um, I, there's road work and I have to make it to an OMAC um, medical fun little appointment. Um, so, <laughs> so I will hand it over to Max and thank you so much everybody for being here and for taking the steps you're taking to help all of us become more wildfire resilient. Take it away, Max. I started firefighting in 1981. Uh, I've always wanted to be a firefighter. So I volunteered on Orcas Island and got into fire prevention after that. Just kind of fell into it. And I've been doing it ever since. And my biggest uh, push is seniors and wildland fire. So this is a perfect fit for me. So today I thought I would share with you 
a, a small program. This is my first time doing a Zoom um, slide pr program, so bear with me. <laughs> Catherine and I are going to team up here. This is going to be a program based on the National Firewise program and then uh, the pre-mitigation stuff that, or the mitigation stuff that firefighters do when, if they get a chance to prepare property for a fire when it's coming. Sometimes we have minutes, sometimes we have a day or two. La I, th I believe it was two summers ago, they were the firefighters, that's all they did was down Twist River was mitigate people's homes. That's a very rare situation. Those people were very fortunate. <laughs> So today we'll talk about the simple steps you can take based on this kind of program, which I call Ember Smart. Slide one, or slide two, Catherine. Next slide. There, back, neck, back one. There you go. The land to your door, uh, creating a no burn zone. This house survived uh, the Eagle Rising fire and I was at this house when the fire struck. We had gone up in uh, the fire trucks to set up mitigation the best we could at, because the fire was heading this direction. We had very high winds. Uh, we got up here, we had a fire engine, a brush engine, and then a water tender, which is a great big great big tank of water and we got kind of stuck up here because the fire burned across the bottom of the road but we felt pretty safe um, this place had had some mitigation done and had a, a metal roof and a nice green space which you can see next to the house to the left was a large garden area and so we felt pretty safe about being there with the fire coming at us uh, and due to, due to the fact that we were there and that there, some of the mitigation work had happened, uh, this place survived. Next slide, Catherine. I took this picture from the spot that I, I decided to take my stand. What we did, did was run around and move all the firewood, anything that we could possibly move away from that end of the fire. Uh, made sure that it was clear, cleaned up around the uh, propane tank. And then we made sure all of our water lines were ready to go. As you can see, there is a uh, sagebrush literally leading up to this property and then onto the property. So it was a little bit dicey. Uh, but we were able to set up a hose line here at the front and then we had hose lines at the side and the point was not to put the fire out but to just drive the fire around this area. Next slide. So the last slide was at uh, 929. The fire is burned through uh, it took, like I said, about five minutes. It got really hot. I was standing up where the smoke is coming up at the point of that fire. And at one point I backed up, but at no time did I think I was going to lose my life. But it would have been nice to have had a little bit more space between the brushland and the house itself. Uh, the fire swept through and because of the wind it and the way this property sat, it was sitting longwise instead of crosswise to the wind, which was in his favor. Since this fire, he's done some uh, fire mitigation, uh, but he has not moved his firewood, which it would have been really helpful because it took a long time to try to put that out. And apparently much, many, several hours later, that pile lit back up, but somebody on the cross the valley was looking at it with uh, binoculars, reported it, and they ran back in there and were able to put that out. There was no other fire in the area. It was just that there had been some embers skunking around inside of that, uh, inside of that wood pile. Next slide. Before we start, let's get some uh, very important terminology down. Wind, 
wind is a really important factor in wildland fire in the valley. As we know, wind's always going one direction or another uh, in the valley. You know, down, what is it, up valley in the morning, down valley in the, in the afternoon. This is the Rising Eagle fire and the wind did have a huge uh, impact upon how fast that fire was moving because it was ripping. Uh, whenever you're dealing with fire, just keep, keep your mind, one part of your mind on where is, the, where is there wind every day is, if you're at your house, you kind of know if the wind's going to pick up at a certain time of the day and be thinking about that. If a fire starts, you might go, oh, thank goodness, usually the wind's going the other way for me during the day. But it's, a best, it's best to be aware of fire, especially when it's impacted by wind. Next. Embers, that's, our, that's the biggest issue, especially with the wind. Anything that gets burned, it's small enough, the, the heat rises, so, so does the little pieces that are on fire. And then they drop ahead of the fire. They're being pushed along. And a lot of fire uh, spread in this valley in particular, in this area, is due to ember spread. You'll hear them say they're spot fires. Spot fires are where an ember actually landed in something that it could take off. Uh, it it kind of collects in a, around a home, those little pieces collect in about the same places that the snow builds up at your place. So if you've got a, a niche near your back porch where the wind always blows all that snow into a little pile, it that may also be a place where embers can build up. So that's something to keep in mind if you've got, if you throw all of your recyclables over in that corner in the summer, there could be embers building up there like they would have in the winter. So it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, this would be a good time to talk about a red flag warning because that usually is a combination between wind and the worry of flying embers and if they're going to ignite when they hit. It really means that we've got warm temperatures, low humidity, and stronger winds. So that combination creates a warning. And if you hear about red flag anything, that's a time to, to look into it be aware, know what's going on. There could be a red flag warning in Chelan County, and that's not going to bother us as much as if there's one in Okanagan County and it's downwind from us or upwind from us. So it's it's something to keep in mind and don't don't ignore those warnings. They they are not put up lightly. It may seem like they come on and off and on and off. That's because we get really worried and we want people to and ourselves to have as enough enough warning as possible and the fire departments pay very close attention to red flag warnings themselves okay next slide here's some simple steps that you can take keep your grass short keep it green or keep it green and short uh it's grass is a uh, green grass is really hard to burn it does burn but it's hard to burn it burns slower and it works sort of like a moisture barrier if it's wet enough. If you can't keep your grass green, keep it short. And fire doesn't really follow any particular rules, especially lately, but to get a better idea of how flame and fuel, especially grasses, uh, react or brush, think of it as times three. If you've got two inches of grass, you'll have six inches of fire on top. That's just a, a real light gauge. If you have two feet of brush or grass, you're gonna get six feet of flame. Now we use these calculations so we know if we can attack a fire with hoses or if we need to get equipment, so on and so forth. So it is just a rule of thumb, but that will help you kind of make some decisions about how to back up your fuel and what you need to do. And I, I have a whole bunch of grass around my place. There's no way I can keep it all watered. So about this time of year, I let a lot of it die off and then I just set the mower on one and just cut that sucker right down there. And then keep an eye on it and keep the weeds out of it. I go out there and mow the weeds about every week or so. Next slide. So it's removing the stuff around your house that can burn. And 
creating that no burn border. And you don't have to get all fancy and pave it or solid rock it or haul in gravel. Just getting it down to dirt or the stuff on the ground that does not burn. So you can't get it down to dirt, but you've got a nice green ivy or vinca bed right up to your foundation. If you can't pull that away, that's less of a danger than a bunch of pine needles or all the dead stuff that fell off of all of the bulbs and are kind of piling up in heaps and drying so nicely in the sun and the wind right now. Just pulling it back away from the house helps. Remember that little rule of thumb, if you've got three inches of flame there, that times three, you got nine, I mean, three inches of pine needles, you might have nine inches of flame. So you'd want it back far enough so hopefully it wouldn't touch the building. Even 12 inches makes a huge difference, especially if it's not windy in that particular spot. Next slide. That's a pretty good picture of embers had landed in some dry vegetation next to the house. I did not take this picture, but you can see the embers flying through the air here and they're affecting the, uh, the gutters or some stuff on the roof, but boy, it's going next to the house. And because there's wind, the flame is being pushed against the house. And Obviously, the stuff up to where the fire is, it looks like it might be pavement or something. It's not burning. So you pull that stuff back onto the pavement and it looks like you'd have a border. It would, you know, it wouldn't spread as much. Next slide. Something to remember too is if you have wood fences or wood posts, pull that, uh, that stuff away from wood posts, wood fences, the sides of any sort of wood flower beds that would eventually bring the wood, um, bring the fire to your house. In the summer, we go back. These are actually my garbage cans. <laughs> um, in the summer, we move them away from the house and I make sure that they've always got lids on them, even the plastic ones. It takes a bit for a little ember to land on a plastic garbage can lid and cook through that plastic enough to get it burning, but it doesn't take much for it to fall down into the garbage can and find something that's dry enough to burn. Uh, we, as firefighters, will move stuff like this away from the house. Uh, it's a good time uh, to pull in your recycling containers. If you recycle your newspaper or your cardboard out where it could be hit by sparks. Keep that in mind. Maybe move it to a different location in the summer away from structures or away from where it would, you know, like if you put it in your basement and there's no sparks down there, chances are it's not going to get it. That's not going to get ignited by a wildland fire. Next slide. As firefighters, we end up doing this a lot. We move a lot of firewood away from people's houses and structures, and we don't stack it. We throw it as hard as we can in every direction. So to save us that kind of trouble and you having to restack it, because we don't come back and restack it either, uh, you might want to move your firewood away from structures so that the sparks don't land in it. Uh, like the house that I showed you at the beginning, that firewood was probably stacked about three and a half feet. So that, you know, times three, there was pretty good flame length coming off of that. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't up against the house, but it was darn close and had the wind push that flame uh, from the firewood, which is the perfect thing to have uh, for a, a fire. That's why we have firewood. Uh, if it had pushed the wind, the wind had pushed that flame towards the house, there was plenty to, uh, of things that could have ignited it. Uh, if you can't move it, maybe cover it with a uh, structure or metal roofing, something that sparks would land on and not ignite. Heavy canvas tarps. We use heavy canvas tarps in um, saving stuff inside of burning houses. We throw it over so they're not fireproof, but they're very flame resistant. It takes a long time to get a canvas uh, tarp burning unless you've been soaking it in oil or something. Next slide. 
heat traps. Uh, a lot of us, including me, store stuff underneath the deck, underneath overhangs, uh, especially in the winter. It's a good idea if because you can't get rid of those heat traps for the most part. And that's places where if something's burning, you can it'll build up the heat underneath of there. And normally a deck doesn't burst into flames, but if you get enough heat going underneath of it, you could get it to smolder and then catch. That's any end of any deck, end of your house, side of your shop, places where you the, it's gonna it has somewhat of a ceiling or something that will hold the heat in. A good idea to move the gas and, and your weed eater and your lawnmower out from those places and just for the summer, you know, during fire season. Or if you can't, if you are evacuating, that would be really nice if you clean those out real quick if it's where you've been keeping your fuels. Uh, mostly you would have to do this long before. I mean, I've got a lot of stuff underneath mine, so I have to clean it out earlier. Next slide. Decks and porches. Um, one of the, this is one of the big things that the mitigation uh, teams will do is get through and try to get the stuff out from under the decks or away from decks and porches. Uh, same with the railings and steps going down into the wildland. I, I know of a firefighter who was checking houses, which we do long after the fire left, and he found the bottom step uh, smoldering on a four step entrance onto somebody's uh, porch to their house. Had he not caught that, and it was just smoldering at the time, but it could have been sitting there while the evacuation was on and eventually cooking away and then uh, taking the flame right up to the side of the house. So mitigating around, add that little no burn border around your porches uh, and clean out the stuff that embers could roll into underneath of your deck. I can't get to the whole, everything underneath my deck, but I can at least pull the stuff out that I can see. And boy, there's a lot of dead leaves under there. <laughs> That's where they all seem to go on my property. Uh, that's not my deck. <laughs> Next slide. Now this is Catherine's propane tank. I <laughs> used it for my mitigation. Uh, they always get b built up around them and it's a pretty easy thing to just weed whack. You don't have to clear it way, way, way away. Uh, following that three times the fuel, just cleaning the grasses away and getting the cardboard and the garden stuff that might be stacked up against your propane tank. If you've got a wood fence around uh, your propane tank, you especially wanna keep the area in between the wood fence and the propane tank clear. If you've got stuff hanging over the top of your propane tank, you really wanna clear that away too because these tanks are built to vent so that they don't blow up. And when they vent, they can shoot fuel into the air and occasionally that, or during a wildland fire, that fuel will ignite and it shoots a good 20 feet in the air. So you wanna keep the tree branches and things like that from hanging over the actual propane tank. Uh, I mitigated a propane tank that was 35 feet long. It was the biggest propane tank I'd ever seen. It was at a communication center. And the only thing we had to do was build a little fire trail all the way around it and the fire didn't bother it. It went elsewhere. It was amazing because it was a ground fire. So it just crept right up to the trail, stopped burning and left. So that little bit of mitigation can make a big difference. For us, we have to remember the wind. So make sure that those tall grasses that could lean against the tank are pushed back far enough. Next slide. Uh, small propane tanks move. This one was actually one I took a picture of over uh, in a fire several years ago, just over the hill here in Omac. We mitigated uh, this property with the homeowner and this propane tank was hooked to his barbecue. We just unhooked it, made sure it was turned off and then set it out away from the house. You can see there is some fuel around it but it's where everybody's gonna see it. The fire engine isn't gonna back over it when it's trying to turn around in the driveway and it's not gonna secretly light up 
when the fire comes close to it. So setting it out in the driveway where firefighters can see them, disconnecting them, putting them. I wouldn't put them indoors. I would definitely avoid doing that if possible. Uh, nasty surprise when those go off in a fire. Uh, also, if you have uh, gas barbecues or propane barbecues on your deck that are hooked to a hose or, or what's called hard connection, any hard connections, you should shut those off at the house and then move your appliance away from it so we know that it's been disconnected. Um, I'll, uh, and there was a, I did check with the propane company and they said, yes, it's okay to go out and turn your propane tank off at the tank if it's safe. I mean, you don't want to go running out there during a fire, but if you're, especially if you're evacuating because you think there might be fire there, you can turn it off at the tank, but you have to have them come back out and turn it on because they have to pressure test the lines and make sure you're not going to have a propane leak uh, after, I mean, they, they check for all of those things and you don't want to take a chance with that. I've also encountered that and it was a terrible fire. Okay, next slide. This was a propane tank that caught on fire uh, off the West Chewok several years ago at a regular house fire. And you can see that it's venting. The tank itself is not on fire, but all of the gas coming out of it, it's liquid in the tank, but it expands when it comes out. So it took about five hours to burn that tank down. So they do go for quite a while. And after they, if they catch on fire and they burn for a while, the little settings on the top just kind of burn off and then they, you have to wait for the tank itself to burn down. And that's what was happening here. And it's a, it's a good uh, example of, of a tank, tank venting. It sounds like a jet engine if you ever hear it do that, just so you can see what it looks like. That's why you want to cut stuff away from your propane tank so it doesn't catch it on fire by accident. All we do in a propane tank fire is try to keep the tank cool. We don't put it out because we don't want all that gas pooling up and running around. We just let it burn and keep the tank cool as possible. And that's it. Okay, next slide. Roof fires. Uh, that's 25% of your risk is your roof. If you can't have a non-flammable roof, which is metal, tile, composition, you really, really need to pay attention to keeping it as clean as possible. Around here, we don't have gutters for the most part to worry about, so it doesn't build up on the edges of our decks. But again, the places where snow might build up on your roof, you might get the same sort of ember build up. And you sure as heck don't want a bunch of tinder laying up there like pine needles, all perfectly dry and ready to go because it's so dry on top of a roof. So you want to keep it as clean as possible. And if you are evacuating, you can leave a ladder up to your roof so the firefighters can get up there and uh, if, if they have time and if it's possible to protect your roof. And it's nice to keep uh, the branches from hanging over your roof and then dropping stuff. But also if, you're, uh, if the tree should ignite, uh, the branches hanging over it have a better chance of dropping embers directly onto your roof. Uh, and also, if you keep this stuff tidy in this fall when we have fire, uh, chimney fire season come up, there's less likely, uh, less likely for the fire embers off of your own chimney landing on this stuff and starting a chimney fire. Okay, home vents. Uh, these are important to us because of the wind-driven fires, so it's, it's really nice to have those little covers. Some people's vents are so high up in the air, you cannot get to them, and so deal with what you can. I mean, in some cases, it's impossible to block vents. In other times, it's not something you would even think about. You can buy vent covers or you can pre-cut uh, you can use little pieces of plywood covered with foil work really well, but it's best to get the, the vent covers. If you're doing this as an emergency, 
you can take aluminum foil and fold it into really, really thick chunks and then put it over your vent, but that's only a temporary fix. It could be blown loose in the wind and they certainly won't make it through pack rat season. So you want to have uh, vent covers that work for you that keep the embers from blowing in. Next slide. Next slide, Catherine. Okay, good. That's good. Uh, there's the there's a lot of controversy about this. Uh, the power company should be doing it. Oh, it's too dangerous to go do it. If you feel comfortable about cleaning around your own power pole uh, and you're of average adult intelligence, you should be safe and you shouldn't have any trouble. Don't dig, um, just pull the weeds away from a power pole. But uh, a lot of times, like during the Carlton complex, a lot of firefighters were tied up protecting poles, trying to keep the electricity and uh, communications on as long as possible. And I know the power company has been working on that, both power companies have. And it's something that this one um, is very close to my yard and I had one that looked just like this in my yard and I just clean this stuff away from it. Uh, it's just, it's very helpful personally to, to keep your power going as long as possible. And these are very uh, time consuming fires because we can't really put power, we can't really put water on the poles if they're energized. So all we're doing is protecting it from going other places. So they burn for a long time. So anyway, next slide. So important, get an address sign, please have something. Uh, the dispatch is located over in Riverside by OMAC. They don't know our landmarks. They don't know our friends, the, the homesteaders, the people that we use as, you know, turn at Jensen's, go a quarter of a mile up to the mailbox and then turn at the rock. They don't, they have, they only dispatch us to an address or the closest address, especially in wildland fires, uh, somewhere be around 2981, we've got a wild, we've got a ditch fire. And that helps us find the location, even if it's not an actual address or where the, uh, the fire is being called from. So we can go to that location and then look and see where the fire is. Address, if you've got one, maybe you could help your neighbor get one. It's just incredibly helpful, uh, especially for medical reasons, uh, because there's no fire lighting our way. The EMS really need the, uh, and anybody responding really needs addresses. Next sign. Try to put it where we can see it on a dark and stormy night uh, where the headlights on a fire truck are gonna hit it. So about waist height. In the summer, a lot of weeds grow over stuff and we can't see the whole sign. Uh, just, so, just a reminder to keep things clean. Okay, next slide. Burn barrels. Burn barrels have been illegal since at least 2000 across the whole state. It's not a, it's not a well-kept secret. Uh, I had a burn barrel. I burned everything I could possibly find in my burn barrel, but then they became illegal. And that's why, because I was burning everything in it. Uh, also for uh, such a small item, they start amazing amounts of fires uh, because they hold embers and heat and people feel they're contained so they leave and they start back up. Uh, we've, we've had some pretty serious fires here in the valley recently. Um, they, they cause garbage to convert into what we have to breathe as well. So it's, they're really, really not a good idea. Um, there was a 175 acre fire started in the valley. Uh, I think it was two summers ago or maybe last summer. And there were no homes lost, but they, it, it, they do start a lot of fires. I go to fires in the valley started by uh, burn barrels. We go to them every year. They're illegal. They are being ticketed. And now the DNR is getting very involved because it's a good fundraiser. So you definitely 
want to stay away from burn barrels. It doesn't matter if old Clyde down the street does it. Don't do it, <laughs> especially if you live on Twist River Road, because those people are very, very cautious. You don't want to be burning in areas that there's been big fires. Okay, next slide. This can be very overwhelming. I know Catherine's been through it. A lot of people have just, they've, they've gone through the list and said, uh, I, I can't do this. <laughs> it's too much. There's too much to do. So start at your house. Every inch you work the, the fuels away from your house is one inch better. 12 inches make a huge difference and work it out as far as you can. And in some cases, you might run right up against your neighbor's fence, which is, what, three feet off your bathroom window. You can only go so far off your property in some cases. So do what you can, get up your, get your address sign in there and, and keep, keep really aware. We, we talked last time about the five things you could do at home, like signing up for the uh, announcements from emergency management. So that's my presentation. I, if anybody has any questions, and Catherine, you need to bolt. <laughs> Thank you so much, Catherine. Thanks. That was excellent, Max. I had a question, um, if I can find it. Maybe somebody else does. Go ahead and raise your hand, Catherine. Oh, she's waving goodbye. She's well, I was waving goodbye, but I was also just going to say, um, with the vent covers, there are contractors in the valley who are now helping people with the higher vents that Max was talking about. Um, they're hard to hard to come by. They're sort of the general contractors, but um, and right now I say that, and there's no one I can suggest because my own husband is crawling around putting these little round soffit uh, covers in 160 soffit holes that we have. We don't have the vents, we have soffits. And we thought all the mesh that was in there was um, metal, but it turned out that the original construction has fiberglass mesh of one eighth inch, um, which is a good size for keeping most of the embers out, but it's the wrong material. So, um, that's just something to be aware. I know Okanagan Conservation District is going to be your best bet for finding out information about use of um, different soffit covers and protections. And um, they do have a list, which I gave to Deirdre, of uh, different contractors and resources who might be able to help. So with that, I will jet. And thank you so much, you guys. And Max, Thank you. That was a good presentation. Tracy, thank you for making all this possible. I'll see you yeah, guys later. Thank you so much, Catherine. Bye. Yeah, I guess I had the another question about the vent covers. Do you leave those on all year long or is it just seasonal? Do they come on and off? Most people take them on and off. Um, a lot of people put them up for the winter. Um, I think I think it's very individual depending on your t what your circulation is i mean here it's really dry in where i live and so leaving the vent covers on haven't been hasn't been a big deal uh i i think you have to check with your your particular situation that's kind of a hard mm -hmm. one to call great any other questions out there you can go ahead and unmute or uh there's a little hand you can push and raise. There must be some kind of question out there. <laughs> hey, I covered it so good, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm looking for that hand to go up. Or any comments? Comments. Was it understandable? I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> I thought it was great. Here comes Frauke. Frauke, do you want me to help you unmute? Um, there we go. <laughs> uh, Max, thank, thank you so much. It was excellent. Um, question, 
I think Max computer, he might want to mute his or something. There. My doggy. My doggy. <laughs> um, I'm going to go in another room and see if it works. <laughs> ah. um, can you hear me? That's better. Okay. Um, uh, will this be out? I mean, is this in a written form as well? Sort of. I, uh, been, I have been posting this stuff on Facebook and I'm about to put out the fire department newsletter. So it'll be, I'm a little late right now, but I, it gets sent to everybody and I can put all of that information. That's what this next newsletter is about is uh, fire ember wise type things. Hmm. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was excellent. Thank you. Okay, and Gudrun has had her hand up, so. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, now, where do we get those address uh, stickers or the, you know, the, 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 the stuff that we're supposed to put up to, you know, the. If you, if you want to, you can order them through the fire department. Uh, if you go to the website, Okanagan County Fire District 6, there's a Okanagan, link on there. Okay, Okanagan County Firewire 6. Uh, fi what did you say? Six. Okanagan County Fire District 6. Fire District 6. Okay. There's a lot also, of districts. <laughs> also, Gudrun, in the packet that Met How at Home sent out, there is an order form in that packet. Oh, is there? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. I will, I'll have to get on Rob's. Um, yeah. <laughs> And Christy, that's your hand up. So uh, my question about grass is a little different than the one you answered. So the uh, choice that we frequently face is, uh, is it better to cut tall green meadow grass and, or uh, leave it tall and green? If you cut it, the part you cut off then becomes fuel until it falls down into uh, the duff. Uh, if you leave it standing, it's well oxygenated, but it's green and still pumping some water. Do you have some advice there? I have a field up next to my house, which is not mine, and I always feel pretty comfortable about it when it's green. It's now curing, and that's the hard part because it's not watered. If you had long green grass, you're right. If you cut it, you'd need to pick it up because you'd have fuel on the ground. It's short fuel because it's laying down. So uh, I guess the calculation would be, I have, I have seen green grass burn, uh, which is, was surprising to me. Uh, mostly it was alfalfa and that stuff does burn green. Uh, I guess it depends on the grass and your situation. Uh, long green grass is better than long brown grass. <laughs> If that helps, it probably doesn't help much. But if you knock it down, you will have fuel on the ground. If it's standing and it's green, it, it's it's more of a of a fire break unless it's a flammable type of grass. Thank you. Great, great questions. And the, Peter, was that yep. your hand up? <clears throat> Yeah, I was just curious, um, how much of a risk are irrigated shrubs, uh, small trees, other plantings in the, you know, uh, nearby a house? It depends on the type of plant. Uh, the fires I've seen that around here that have taken out houses are, a lot of times the greenery is left standing, which is kind of an, an odd thing to see. Um, things like fir trees, uh, the needles are perfectly spaced apart and they've got the beautiful resin in it. So fir, pine, spruce, that type of thing are more flammable green. I mean, I mean they're, they, they are green and they are flammable uh, as opposed to a willow, a maple, uh, the ornamental shrubs that we have around our home for the most part are usually, if they're green, 
they're far less flammable. There are some like juniper are, is gasoline, you know, it's terrible stuff and it burns hot and it will burn green. So having, I have two junipers, but I have them cut back and right. I use those for, uh, for, you know, visual blocks. So that's why I want to have them around. Um, if you have flammable bushes that you don't want to cut out, then add them to your mitigation. You know, you mitigate around them, keep the fuels down, keep them nicely trimmed. Don't let the stuff build up underneath of it and don't let it touch your house or your structures. But yeah. green is so like a, a maple or a cherry tree that's irrigated. You yeah, those, those do not <laughs> carry fire. They will burn, but they don't. It's not like they go poof, like on Bugs Bunny, like some fir trees do. And right. they don't send a lot of embers into the air either. They're just wet, gooey, and they just kind of curl up and fall. They don't, they don't loft. So <laughs> I have a lot of that stuff around my house. Uh, the, the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Dave. Yeah. Uh, backing up a little bit on the address signs, any idea how long it takes the fire? department to get those made? Uh, when they're doing a big push, uh, John Owens does those himself in his basement <laughs> or his workshop. So if it's, um, they do a big push once a month, I know, and try to get them all done. If he knows that someone needs it, he'll get it done. And we're getting close to fire season and we didn't have our big push on the 4th of July because usually we're out, you know, post uh, talking about signage. So, um, if you talk to him, he'd probably, he's here right now too. He'd probably crank it right out. And I think he's got two helpers now too. I did order, I ordered them, I think right after our, right after this last presentation. So that's been a week or so. Oh, you know, yeah, and I think he just got back. So um, uh, you might just text him and see how it's going. It could be done and it could be at the fire station um, waiting for the delivery. Uh, or I thought I'd pick it up at the fire station. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. So I, do, they, do they call? You know, I, I don't know what he's doing right now. Everything's been so odd since this whole COVID thing. Things yeah. are just kind of touching base with him, I'm sure wouldn't hurt a bit. Okay. I'll do that. Thanks. Yeah. Great questions, everybody. Any Anything else for Max? Max, thank you. You're have so much expertise i just i feel so blessed that we got to uh i love to doing this. this this is this is what i used to do for a living till i moved here now i build furniture but i like doing this and as soon as i get into a situation that i can i would love to go around and do home business i'm not quite there yet <laughs> uh, any other questions while we have <coughs> Here. Tracy, Tracy um, just a quick question. Service berry, uh, is it similar to what has been described already or um, what about that? That's a neutral plant okay. as far as I know. It's, okay. not, it's not a fire bearing but it will build, burn. The resiny ones are the ones you really want to look, look carefully at, anything with resin in it. Okay, thank you. I guess that's the it. The service berries are so good this year. I've been mm -hmm. really loving those. Dave. Um, another plant question. What about lavender? Mm. No, I would have to check on that. I know Catherine was doing some research on it. It's a very oily plant at certain times. And then other times it's not, but it's also not extremely hot, tall growing, at least mine sure isn't. Mine's pretty uh, tall. We've got quite a big, quite a big clump of it right up against the base of the house. That's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I, if you dropped a match into it, do you think it would ignite? It might, because there's, you know, it's been there for a while. So there is some drier, older stuff underneath the green stuff. Yeah, so the, I know the rental I was living at, I kept, I cleaned out that stuff underneath because I was worried about it, but I loved it and I wasn't going to cut it down. Um, I could look into that and then maybe I'll talk to Catherine and then 
is there a way I can get a hold of you or I can send it to you, Tracy? Yeah. Send yeah. It, you know? I think I can send it to you. Plus, it has to get across the grass, which won't burn, keeping it the height. Yeah, I know there's a, there is a list that put out by the Master Gardeners for our area that talks about different plants. Some plants are good at certain times of the year, some of them shear out at a bad time. Uh, and different areas have different times for that. So uh, I think we can find that through the Conservancy. I think they've got that little booklet too, but I'll, I'll find out and get that information to Tracy. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of us have lavender. I do. <laughs> I know I want to know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Look at this. 1029. We're like on schedule. I love it. We, we recovered from yeah. our <laughs> hit earlier technical hiccup. Any other last minute questions for Max? And just remember, everybody, if you need a hand, um, you know, getting some space around your home, especially if it's the raking or moving wood piles, things like that, that don't require like heavy duty equipment. And then please, if you're a member, call us at MetHow at Home and, and uh, we can get that service request in. That's wonderful. I love MetHow at Home. <laughs> Who doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, Max. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Excellent.